Well, good morning, everybody. This morning, we find ourselves back in Romans. We're in chapter 14. I'm going to do something that hitherto uh, in this place has never been done. I'm going to go through the entire chapter. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, as we open your word, that which is holy, that which will endure for eternity, I pray that you help our hearts to be open and our minds to be focused, that your Holy Spirit might teach us, mold us into your image, that we might attain to a greater character of Jesus Christ, that our selfish prejudices and distracting thoughts and past experiences wouldn't mold us, but you would. And so, Lord, we want to just lift this time up in each one of our hearts to you and pray that you make us like you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, boys and girls, just to let you know, we are in chapter 14 of Romans. It's talking about our liberty in Christ Jesus and what that looks like. And so I've taken a bunch of scriptures and put them together to kind of uh, give us a fuller picture of what the scripture says. But in chapter 14, verse 4, it says this, Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. You know, sometimes we, we point the finger and judge people, and, and we, if we don't do it with our words, we'd certainly do it with our eye you know, with our eyes, and if not, we do it with our words, um, or we just basically ignore people, or we detach. All of those kind of things where we're showing judgment or condemnation, where we're looking down on somebody. And of course, uh, it, it's, the, it's the atheist's favorite verse, you know, do not judge. Don't judge me, man. So we're going we're gonna to talk about what that looks like and what it really means to do that. We've been going through the book of Romans just to give you an idea of where we've been. The first three chapters, basically Paul's gospel about where we are. And it doesn't matter if you're a pagan, if you're far from God, if you're a moralist, if you have a set of rules you try to live by, of course you fail, or whether you're a religious Hebrew and you've grown up with all the knowledge of the scriptures and the prophets and you say, you know what, I'm sold out for God and one of his chosen people. And yet you fail as well because you can't fulfill what God has expressed as his perfect will. So what do we do? Well, we're all sinners. Every single one of us is broken. We are, we are broken merchandise. Amen? Amen? And yet when the Lord Jesus Christ comes in and we're justified by faith in his sacrifice on the cross, he changes us from the inside out. It's not a matter of just trying to adopt certain uh, practices that are different. It's about a changed life that comes from the inside. The Holy Spirit makes us a new creation in Christ Jesus. We become justified before God just as if I'd never sinned and we're considered holy and God sees us that way. We talked about Adam and Christ in chapter five where the difference between Adam, the first man in Christ, God man, and how he came and fixed all our problems. Sin and sanctification is six to eight. Nine to 11 is Israel's past, present, and future. Yes, there is a future for Israel and God's timetable. And we're gonna be going into the application section, which basically begins from 12 onward to 15, and talks about the application, which is always very, very helpful. What do you do with all of this theology, all of this information, all of these theories? How does it work out in the way that you live your daily life? And basically, everything after chapter 12, 1 is explaining what chapter 12, verse 1 is. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. And do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't be pushed into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, is good, pleasing, and perfect will. So without a changed mind, without a renewed mind, without an understanding of the way God sees things, we're not going to understand God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect, or his good, better, best plans for us. Uh, some of us are just content with good enough. <laughs> but are you willing to, to do what you need to do to receive God's best? 
is really the important thing. And it all comes with the beginning of the transforming of the mind and not being pressed into the world's mold. Chapter 14, verse 1. Yes, 23 verses. <laughs> it's one subject and you'll see why. Receive one who is weak in faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes that he may eat all things. He who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observes, observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. He who gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. Amen. And to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat or drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. That's a big chunk. And yet you can see the singular thread of what that looks like. Because we're in Christ Jesus, we have been freed from the law. We are freed from having to do all of these things. In fact, we never were in obligation to them to be acceptable to God. How many of you sped on the way here? To, no, I, I won't ask for hands. <laughs> but you realize that all of us are contaminated with sin and no matter how progressively sanctified you have become, you fail. And this whole mentality of I have to be good enough is one of those things that pervades us to the point where we have no confidence in, in our flesh, but we also are suspicious of everyone else because they're just as flawed, if not more, than you. And that whole tension is very, very interesting. So let's, 
open it up. He begins by saying, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. I don't know about you, but there are plenty of people I don't agree with. I have a whole list of people I don't agree with. Some of them are my favorite teachers, and I don't agree with everything they say. Uh, you guys probably don't agree with everything I say, and that's okay. The scripture says that we are to receive one who is weak in the faith without picking a fight. We're supposed to be discerning about what's right and wrong, but is it your job to tell everyone where they're wrong? And how's that going for you? <laughs> you know, you could pull a Kramer and just say, you know, you stink. You you know, you're stupid. You know, you could, you could just be honest, just flat out in somebody's face, but there's no love in that, is there? And it doesn't seem like Jesus would do anything like that. It's like having a rabbi come to your church and welcome him in just because you want to have an argument with him. <laughs> I just wanted to go over Isaiah 53 with you. What do you think this is all about? I mean, is David talking about himself or, is talking, you know, or Isaiah talking about himself or somebody else? Yeah, well, it says that we should receive someone who is weak in the faith that maybe doesn't know everything that you know without looking to pick a fight with them. Uh, none of you people, I'm sure, ever struggle with this, but I know that I do. I mean, wouldn't you like to just sit down with the Pope and have a conversation? Oh, the Pope, he's visiting here. Oh, that's great. Let's uh, share the gospel with him. Let's, uh, you know, open the scriptures with him. Let's, hey, the scripture says this. What do you say? It says that we're to receive people who are weak in faith and yet not just to have a fight with them. And we can have people from all different countries who have all different versions of what we understand to be the truth from the gospel, from the Bible. And I don't know about you, but the first thing that I notice about somebody is how different they are from me. If they're short, I notice they're shorter than me. If they're taller, they're taller than me. If, you know, like whatever it is, I'm, I notice differences immediately. How about you? Differences. Oh, 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 it, differences, differences, differences. And we kind of hone in. It's like a magnet to, to, oh, wow, you don't dress like me. You don't talk like me. You're not from around here. What's up with your hair? Why does it look like that? You know, like, I don't know about you, but I have a childish mind or childlike mind. I'll, 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 I'll put it nicely. And I look for differences. For some reason, that's just the way that we are. And he says that you're supposed to receive people without looking to pick a fight. I don't know about you, but that's hard to do. It just is. What would you do if a bunch of bikers rolled in here today? Or a bunch of people from Staten Island? Receive these New Yorkers without seeking disputation, okay? Show the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what if a bunch of bikers came in here dressed unlike you and me? You know, talking and being loud and, you know, all of the things that you might think a stereotypical biker is. Would you seek to pick a fight? Would you try to avoid them because they're just too different from you? It's an interesting thing because the first century church went through all these things too. What about face piercings. You think that's a, you're comfortable with people who have all these face piercings and implants and all this stuff. And, and people come in and you just go like, good morning. <laughs> How would you receive such a person? Would you accept them with the love of Jesus Christ? Or would you just see the differences and say, what is that? And how do you eat with that? I mean, I don't know about you, but that's just those things that roll through my mind. Or what about face tattoos? Because those are cool now, you know. You've got to have a face tattoo or you're nobody. I mean, when we look at people, do we look beyond the differences? Do we see a human soul that God loves? Or do we just see somebody that, I, you know, I hope they don't stick around here because I'll have to love them. I'm so glad I'm the only one that thinks this way. What if Elon Musk showed up with his brand new goth girlfriend? I mean, how would you receive people like this? Number one, I know you're divorced. Number two, I know that she's way younger than you. Number three, I know that you're rich beyond belief. And how do I relate to you as a human being 
who may not know the Lord Jesus Christ as a savior and faces an eternity separated from God? Do I look at the exterior? Do I look at the situation? Or do I look at the soul of a human being and say, here's a person that God loves and so should I? In the first century church, they had issues about this, but it was more elementary. It was about food and drink. And I know you guys never have any trouble with that. But it was about accepting, you have Jews and Gentiles all piling into the same seats and worshiping together. And there are, there are folks that eat pork and they love bacon next to people that would never go near a pig pen. And there's strife because of the differences. And it's no different than us today. Maybe the subjects are slightly different. But it's the same kind of thing that we go through. And I think it's a good idea to look at the scripture and see what it says to the people of that time. But then also, what is God trying to say to us about how we treat people and looking at differences? Verse 2. For one believes that he may eat all things. Yes, I am one of those. But he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. You see, in the Old Testament, there was a bunch of people who were very, very health conscious. Now I know none of you care. But to meet or not to meet, that's the question. Whether it is better to be keto, no slings and arrows for you? Okay. Meat or not to meat. So you could, yeah, because you could live quite well on vegetables apparently, or you could go for the meat eating variety. This, these are the kind of things that people argued about. And it's interesting because you get people, you can go on the internet. You guys know what the internet is? Have you ever been there? There's people who say you should only eat vegetables. You know, that's the way it was in the garden. I mean, after all, God didn't let you eat animals in the garden. So that's the way we're getting back to the garden, like they said at Woodstock. So meat or not to meat? I don't know about you, but I've settled that question. It's an age-old question. Meat or no meat? Meat or no meat? Ian's a vegan. He doesn't eat meat. What? What do you mean he don't eat no meat? <laughs> That's okay. I'll make a lamb. <laughs> if you remember the big fat Greek wedding, that was an issue. Ian is joining this big fat Greek wedding. He happens to be Jewish and he's a vegetarian. They happen to be Greek Orthodox and they cook meat on their front lawn. It's a little different. So the question is, what do you do when somebody has a different perspective than you? I don't know about you, but we tend to treat our opinions like our children and think that ours are the best. But they're just your opinions. Now, if you've got a scripture, I'm glad to look at that. I'm, you know, I'm not supposed to eat meat. Uh, one of the things Jesus actually asked for was fish. So he's a pescator, you know, so he's, he eats meat. It's, a fish is considered meat, but it's the other white meat. <laughs> Jesus criticizes the Pharisees because they are very, very picky about what people eat and what goes in their mouths to the point where they judge them morally by what, what their diet is. Matthew 23, verses 24 to 26, Jesus says, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Real thing, if a rabbi got a, a flea in his teeth, you would see a convulsion. He would be spitting and, and trying to clear his mouth of whatever bug went in because he may have landed on a dog or some other non-kosher sort of animal, and in so swallowing, you have put in your mouth something which is unkosher and violated God's law. None of them had motorcycles, of course. 
they would freak out about that. But what they used to do is they'd sneak out of Jerusalem and they would go one of these meat stands on the side of the road like they have in New York City. And it's a mystery meat. They don't really know what kind of meat it is. But they don't ask. And so they eat the kebabs and they, 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 they're eating camel, which is unkosher. So they were willing to do this, but over here, making a big pretense in front of people, they were spitting and, and choking and vomiting, and trying to remove themselves of this vile thing that has entered their mouth, all for an exhibition. You cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, and the outside of them may be clean also. Jesus says it's more important that what's going on in your heart than what you put in your mouth. Righteousness doesn't come by what you put in your mouth. Righteousness comes by whom you have submitted yourself to. It's not about what food or drink goes in your face. In Mark 7, 15, Jesus said, there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. I'm talking about your words. So, if you're really, really, really holy and you're concerned about every little measure that goes into your mouth and that's become like your religion, don't open your mouth and say anything because you will defile yourself worse than if you ate an entire pizza. But sometimes it's easy to focus on those things that we can control and the things that we really have to submit where we have to be a living sacrifice. Boy, that's hard. You know, being a sacrifice once and done is pretty, you know, you can do that. But being a living sacrifice every day is a much more difficult thing. So be careful that you don't look down on somebody that has a different opinion than you or lives a different lifestyle than you, especially uh, uh, because of their clothing or their food or their chosen profession or, or their appearance. Don't do it. And verse 4, who are you to judge another servant? You ever get people that just, they feel it is their job to take over and instruct everyone wherever they go? Maybe you're one of those people <laughs> that no one's told you. You know, you walk into church, you say, yeah, it's a nice place. I, I don't like what you do with the floor. That's the wrong color because the carpeting doesn't go. And pastor, that tie and those pants. There are people that are just always critical. And it's almost like they're putting you under their authority. Something you may not have noticed. For somebody to come up and give you a criticism like that, not in love, but because that's just what they do. They're critical constantly. Who are you to judge someone else's servant before his own mastery rises or falls? Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. In the church of Jesus Christ, universally, Judgment, gossip is run rampant. Not you good people, but within the church in general, we've got a pretty big reputation for being hypocritical. Jesus addressed that. But there's no place for that because I'm going to stand before God and so are you. And the degree in which you judge somebody else, you put yourself in the line of judgment. So I, I want to have grace on all you all because I need it. Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged. And then he continues, he says, with what judgment you meter out, it will be metered back to you. So if you're going to judge somebody else, you, you better have your catcher's mitt on because you got, you got something coming back at you. People will be judging you. And somebody might pull up verse 4 and say, who are you to judge another man's servant? Before his own mastery rises or falls. Ouch. Before you assume, learn the facts. Before you judge, understand why. Before you hurt someone, feel. And before you speak, think. I thought that was a good ditty. Is this something that the Lord would have me do or say? And is this the way he would have me do or say it? So, I don't know if any of you are professional judges. 
have been to school, have had long lines of success with perfection, but probably not. And we all have to submit to one another. Whether you're a good judge or an angry judge, you're going to have to live with the people around you. And the problem is the people that are judgmental of other people, they're usually just as judgmental on themselves, which is a difficult thing to live with. In fact, we think that God is judgmental and we think that he's angry all day long at us. But we saw his anger that was taken out upon his own son for you and for me. God's deep displeasure at our sinful condition and our volition, our choices to go off and do our own thing were exhibited by what happened to Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I've always thought that God was an angry father figure that just always said, stop that. You're not doing anything right. You'll never be worth anything. You're not, I don't know about you, but those are the voices that went on in my head. And when I discovered the love of our savior, Jesus Christ, and how much God loved me, it melted my heart. Amen. And without that, boys and girls, we're all doomed. So don't become like the angry father figure you may have had or the judgmental person you may have had to submit to. Verse five, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Wow. Wow. That's really interesting. Make sure you are fully convinced in your own mind that, that you know where you stand and why you stand there. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observes the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. <coughs> I got a question. Does the scripture teach that we should worship on Sunday or Saturday? Do you celebrate birthdays? Why? The Jehovah Witnesses will hit you for that one. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8 to 11 says, But then indeed, when did you, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature were not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Paul is talking to the Galatians who have gone back to the law, the Old Testament law, where the way that they're approved by God is that they obey the letter of the law. And that means they keep the Sabbaths, which means making a sacrifice once a year at the temple, which means going back to all of those things which were a shadow and a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. But they went back to it because that's what they knew. They backslid into religiosity. And he says, I'm wondering if you remember the gospel or if you ever received Jesus Christ as your savior at all, because you guys are so legalistic about keeping these laws. It says in Colossians 2, 16 to 23, so let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility, the worship of angels, intruding into these things in which he has not seen, I'm sorry, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commands and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in their self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. As good as God's revealed will, the law is, it does not change your heart. Only God changes your heart. 
And if you try to conform on the exterior to everything that God wants you to do, you are miserable (laughs) because you can't do it and you don't have the power to do it unless you love the Lord and you know that he loves you and you've received the Holy Spirit and suddenly you've got a nuclear-powered engine and you can do anything God asks you to do. You can love those who hate you and turn the other cheek and, you know, go a second mile and you you can do all the things that Jesus asks us to do, but it's not going to be by law-keeping and being religious because that just makes us pat ourselves on the back. So, do you celebrate anniversaries? You got a Bible verse for that? (laughs) Birthdays, holidays, holy days, fish on Fridays? Lent? Ooh. Christmas? Easter? The resurrection. Do you eat kosher? What about the Sabbath? All of these questions people argue about and they wrangle about in the Christian community, right? You got Seventh-day Adventists who meet on Saturday because they believe that's the day you should worship God. I got news for you. I see every day alike. You know what my birthday is? That's right, you don't. (laughs) Because I see every day... I, the day I wake up, it's like it's, I'm celebrating my birthday today because I'm born again and I'm alive today. And I might not be tomorrow. So I'm not going to wait until my next birthday to celebrate. I'm going to be joyful in God today. How about you? I'm not going to wait for an event. Well, I'm going to wait for summer. I hate this season. Oh, so you're not going to be happy until summer gets here. Summer gets here. It's, it's so humid. There are people that are just waiting for the next thing, and once the next thing comes, they don't want the next thing that's there. What's wrong? Their heart. I see every day alike. So when my wife's birthday comes and passes and I forget it, (laughs) I have this passage memorized. I am fully convinced in my own mind that every day is the same. You see, there were Jews who were celebrating Sabbaths. There were Jews that were celebrating all sorts of things. And the Gentiles were like, what's up with you, man? Let's go get a hot dog. That's not kosher. But so what do you do in a congregation where everybody's got a different take on things? You got to have grace. And if you believe you should worship on a Saturday, then you should do that. Does it mean you have to? No because you're not under bondage to the law. Shouldn't you worship every day? I'm going I'm to use my tack. I see every day the same. Why don't you worship God equally all seven days? Don't you think God would be happy with that? Well, you just punch a card on Sunday and that's his day and that's it. He just gets one seventh. The rest of the time's yours. How's that work out? So you guys might recognize this symbol or not. An audience of one. The things that we do, we do for an audience of one. Don't be so misled by doing what everyone else thinks you should be doing. Do what you believe God would have you do. doesn't mean you don't care about people. It just means that you care less for people than you do about God. An audience of one. Your motives matter. It matters why you do the things you should do. Are you doing it to be acceptable to God? By the way, you're already acceptable to God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ if you've received him as your Lord and your Savior. You couldn't make God happier as far as him loving you. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive a reward for the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. If you're a Christian, you follow Christ. You don't follow people. You don't follow trends. You don't follow any of that. You follow Christ. He died for me, and so I live for him. That's the motto of every Christian. He died for me, so I live for him. I don't worry about whatever it is that people are trying to put a guilt trip on me that I should do. You should call your mother. It's Mother's Day. Okay, once a year, I'll call you, and that's it. Oh, why? I wasn't saying that. Yeah, okay. You see, that's why I see every day is the same, and they're all holy. 
Eating, we're back to eating. He who eats, eats to the Lord and gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. If, if there's somebody that is not eating something that you should think they should be eating or they're eating too much of what you think they should be eating or they're eating something completely different that you think should never go in someone's mouth, are you... You know, you know how many calories that has? Do you know the fat content of that? You realize ketosis is never going to happen for you. <laughs> we become extremely intelligent about the workings of the human body, and we become a professor, although we don't necessarily obey. If you can have an ice cream that looks like that and give thanks to God... God bless you. <laughs> because my A1C would just shoot through the roof and I would just fry my internal organs with that much sugar. I am off sugar. Not completely and totally, but mostly. And I tell you what, I wish I could go back to the stupidity that I once exhibited <laughs> in the way that I ate, but I can't. So I will look over at you and judge you I will look and judge you, you sweet-eating people, you, you carboholic, pizza-eating people. Or I could say, you know what, Lord, you give me enough grace all my life to this point. Thank you. I won't put things in my body that are going to kill me early. So if you can thank God for it, if you could take a three-pound burger patty and eat that thing in one sitting, God bless you. But the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And that's about all the judgment I'll share with you. <laughs> so here's the thing. Can, the way that you live your life and the things that you do, can you share that with Jesus? If you're having a glass of wine, a bottle of beer, if you're having a shot or multiples, <laughs> is this something that you can do with Jesus? Eating that ice cream or putting that burger in your face, would you also give one to Jesus if he were with you? You see, that's the key for me. And it's a trite saying, but what would Jesus do? Or what would I do if Jesus were here? And that's really the question for me. What would I do? Would, would I still feel comfortable about doing this? I need to be fully convinced in my own mind that every day is alike. Well, what if Jesus showed up on Saturday? Or what if Jesus showed up on Sunday? Would I suddenly burst into a different level of activity? It's a question I ask myself sometimes. And also... Why does this happen? It's probably me. Romans 14, 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. If there's something that's in your life that you do, if there's an article of clothing that you wear, if there is something that's going on in your life that you eat or drink or smoke or whatever, and you can't do it with Jesus, then you can't do it in faith. So you shouldn't be doing it. It's a pretty good law, right? Kind of a good thing to remember. If I can't do this with Jesus, then I'm not going to do it. Amen. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. You see, everything that we do is really supposed to be for Christ. And so whether we live or we die or whether we eat too much or drink too much or, you know, do silly things, it's all to the Lord, primarily. Secondarily, it's before other people. But we forget that and we think that, well, I am the Holy Spirit police. Well, God has appointed me in this special place where I'm to tell you everything wrong with you. 
Do, do you see how wrong that is? In the context of this, this whole Bible study, it just, you, you cringe when you think, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, I fell into that category, didn't I? 1 Corinthians 6, 15 to 20, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? It's talking about sexual immorality. Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside of the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. That's something we should have memorized for ourselves, not for others. You know, I, I like Ephesians 5, where it says, Wives, <laughs> submit to your husband as to the Lord. Like Sarah was when she called Abraham, Lord, I got that memorized. <laughs> Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and died for her. That's a little more spicy. <laughs> that means I die for my wife. Okay. You see, we just have that proclivity, don't we? That we know what everyone else should do. Don't you know your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit? I would say that to anybody at any point in time for any reason. You're not wearing a mask? Don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> we can use the scripture like a weapon if it's not used properly. A hammer can be used like a weapon or it can be a useful tool. The scripture is the same. Verse 10, but why do you judge your brother? Well, we're back on that again. <laughs> or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Be careful in the way that you judge other people because you will be judged in the same way. And you will have to stand before God for your attitudes, for your words, for your activities, and not for theirs. Sometimes I think, you know, especially if you have kids, don't do that. Don't, don't you look at me like that. Don't you hyper control of your children. I, none of you guys, but I struggled with it. You know, I'm going to stand before God for the way I parented my children, the way I speak to people, the way I show love or I don't show love, or the way I ignore people or the way I judge people. I got enough of my own plate. You know, you, you're going to have to deal with God yourself. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't be involved <laughs> in judging you. I just won't. I, I need grace. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and 13 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Amen. I don't let anything control me. I don't want to let anything control me. Amen. Foods are for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. You know, if we all kept our eyes on our own plates, boy, I think we'd be all better off. And I think the greatest thing that you can be for the people that are around you is an example Amen. of Christ-likeness. And that's a hard thing to do because I'm just not him. You remember in John chapter 21 where Jesus had them fish and they got all these fish and Peter pulls in the thing all by himself and, you know, and he's just standing there dripping in his clothes and Jesus says, let's take a walk. And so he's walking with Peter 
and there's John, young John, following behind them, trailing. It's a good thing because we wouldn't have John 21 without that. And Jesus says this. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Don't know if he meant the other disciples or the fish that he backslid into doing his old profession instead of fishing for men, he was fishing for fish, which was very disappointing until Jesus showed up. He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says it three times to him, right? And he's grieved the third time that he says it. And Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? (laughs) Speaking of John, who's trailing behind them. And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. He was telling Peter, listen, when you were young, you got yourself dressed and you went where you wanted to go, but somebody else is going to dress you up and they're going to take you to a place where you don't want to go. And he was referring to how he was going to die and he died on a cross upside down. And he said, well, what about this guy? Isn't it like that when God asks you to do something difficult and you go, well, what about this guy? Why pick me? What about him? We're always concerned about judging ourselves next to somebody else. Hey, listen, you're asking me to do a tough thing. Why don't you spread it out a little bit? What about this guy? That's like looking at the floor and seeing some junk and say, oh, I got to pick that up. How come no one else picked that up? Hey, Lord, there's a bunch of people in here. None of the people saw that piece of junk on the floor and picked it up. Why do I have to pick it up? Now, I know you people never struggle with that, but I do. And he says, what's that? What's it matter to you? You follow me. Amen? Amen. What a great word that is. Why are you you all twisted up? Just do what I tell you to do. And you know, that's where the real joy is. The real joy is in pleasing the Lord and saying, yes, sir, I love you. You've done everything for me. You've had grace and love towards me. I'm sure you know what you're doing. I'm going to walk into the fire. (laughs) And I don't know what's going to happen on the other end, but I know that God is faithful and I'm going to do it. And he's mine and I'm his. And that's just, that's settled. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. You realize he's writing this to a particular church and he's saying, you guys are full of judgers. Therefore, do not judge one another anymore. So it's a continual habit that's going on. But rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in your brother's way. Well, how do you do that? I may do something stupid, like come to church in a guinea tea. (laughs) Now, my arms are okay. Okay. But you shouldn't have to look at me in a guinea tea all morning. (laughs) So I won't do that. You're welcome. (laughs) Or a shirt that cuts off here. (laughs) You look at my fuzzy navel. There are ways that you stumble people by doing stupid, selfish things. You see me at McDonald's. I I will feel shame (laughs) because I should never eat at McDonald's. I haven't been there and I haven't ordered food from there in a million years. I go there to drive other people there, but I don't go there. I don't eat there. But there are certain things that we can do to stumble other people. You won't see me up here drinking alcohol. Why is that? Because I might be able to handle it, but you won't. I came from a background where my father died of alcoholism. So did my brother. And it's done a lot of bad in my family. I saw it ruin the marriage of my mother and my father. It killed my father and killed one of my brothers. So I have a definite opinion on alcohol. But I'm the one who's fully convinced in my own mind that I know what I need to do and what God's called me to do. And some people have the liberty to drink and some people don't have the liberty to drink. But it's not just about whether it's okay for you. What about the people around you? 
I mean, it might be okay for me to do all kinds of things. Not when I'm with you. You will never see me wear, for instance, a two-piece bikini. <laughs> Obviously. Are you going to be somebody who insists upon your liberty in Jesus Christ to the point where you tear down your brothers and sisters around you? That's the thing. There's a difference between wickedness and weakness. Sometimes we determine weakness to be wickedness, but it's really not. There are people who are weak in their faith. They're not strong enough to be able to handle certain things. And so you want to be sensitive. What do you do with somebody's wickedness? You expose it. What do you do with somebody's wick, your, with their weakness? You cover it. So if you mistakenly think that something is wickedness when it's really weakness, instead of covering it in love like you're supposed to, you're going to confront in a judgmental fashion because you have them confused. These are things that can happen or this book wouldn't have been written to these good people. Am I being harmful or helpful? These are questions I need to ask, not because I'm a people pleaser and I need everyone to like me and accept everything I do, but because I don't want to be a stumbling block to the people around me. Maybe I could have a giant thing of ice cream and my A1C will forgive me. But what will that do for you? <laughs> oh, Pastor Dave ate this giant thing of ice cream. It's, it's amazing. And I'm going to embolden you to eat ice cream, am I not? Don't do it. Verse 14, and I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Did you see that? Not ice cream, not McDonald's. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. McDonald's is unclean to me. It's interesting because I think of Peter when he had the sheet that was lowered and it had all these non-kosher animals in it. And he lowered this sheet in a dream, and, and uh, or vision actually, and, and Peter saw it and a voice from heaven said, take and eat, Peter. I'm a good Jewish boy, I don't eat these things. And Peter said, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And the Lord said, don't call unclean what I've cleansed. And then because Peter needs everything in threes, he did it two more times. And Peter said two more times, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. It took three times. And then there was a knock at the door with some Gentiles at the door. And they said, listen, Cornelius, who's our, he's kind of our boss. He told us to come get you and where to find you. In chapter 10, you can check it out in the book of Acts. And he goes into the house and he's in the house with a bunch of Gentiles which is weird for a good Jewish boy because you don't go into the house because you're defiled in the Jewish tradition. And he goes, listen, I shouldn't even be here. This is the Jersey version. Shouldn't even be here, but I'm here and I'm going to tell you what I know. And he told them all about Jesus and they all spoke in tongues as proof to the non-believer, uh, Peter, who didn't believe what he was seeing, that this was the Holy Spirit just as they had received in Pentecost. And the Gentiles, like you and I, have been ushered into the kingdom. Yeah, I'm glad for that too. Don't call unclean what I've cleansed. And so it kind of broke with all of the Jewish tradition that they were used to. And the Gentiles, being a picture of all these animals that you don't partake of, were now welcomed in. Verse 15 Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. By the way, that's the most important thing. Amen. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Doesn't it, isn't it amazing that you can destroy someone with what you eat or drink and food can be an offensive weapon on somebody? If you sit down with a good Jewish friend and you order a bacon cheeseburger... Will you not offend them? Will it not hinder your witness for Jesus Christ to them? If you have a Hindu friend 
and they invite you out and you have a steak and they're a vegetarian and they believe that there was a soul in that animal that you're eating. Could have been my reincarnate grandmother. Will you not set up a blockade for the work of Christ in their life? Just by food. Not that you're a people pleaser and you got to worry what everyone thinks. Do what you know the Lord would have you do so you don't offend anybody. And the most important thing is that you're showing the love of Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we don't think about that. And so we do things that offend people universally. Please, God, don't let anyone ask me to come out drinking tonight because you know that I'm weak. I remember I used to pray that prayer. <laughs> Lord, I, uh, these guys are going to call me. They call me every Friday night, and then I go out, and then I feel miserable, and I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I don't want to do it anymore. And he said, leave the house. Cell phones haven't been invented yet. <laughs> and I left the house, and when they called, I wasn't home. <laughs> I went swimming. I went roller skating. I, I went playing pool. I went doing anything all by myself because I didn't know what fellowship was yet. Get yourself out of temptation if you're in a position of temptation. Well, tonight I'm only going to have one drink. <laughs> I remember saying that too and it never worked out because I didn't understand the power of God. So, for the longest time in my life, I didn't touch alcohol. I didn't have anything to do with alcohol. I wouldn't have Vicks 44 if I had a cough. I wouldn't take any medication. To this day, I still don't take acetaminophen, aspirin, ibuprofen, whatever you got, you can keep it. I'll have the headache and I'll get over it and it'll be okay. I'll be all right. But if you need acetaminophen, I was very judgy. What are you doing? If you got a headache, God wants you to have a headache. Get over it. You're supposed to have pure joy in your trials. What's wrong with you? You don't need VIX-44. You know there's alcohol in that. Look at the back. You check the contents. There's alcohol. Active ingredient. What are you doing? I was belligerent because I was judgy. I know none of you. but And so I had a real problem with it because I had a problem in my own life. But praise God, I don't do those things because I don't want to offend people. 1 Corinthians Chapter 8, now concerning things offered to idols, there were Gentiles who would take animals and make sacrifices to idols, like Zeus, like Baal, who are not gods at all. These are demons. And this meat would then be cut up and some of it sold in the marketplace. And there were some good Jewish people in the church that said, if you eat that meat, you are supporting that industry. And it might have an evil spirit in it and it'll get in you and then you'll turn into a maniac. These things actually occur. Concerning these things that are offered to idols, we know that we have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. You see, what I thought I knew about alcohol, I didn't know anything. But if anyone loves God... This one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. And even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, for there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of an idol, until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Do you understand that? There were Christians that felt bad. They would go and they'd say, ah, the meat was cheap. I had to buy it. I know it was offered to a demon. Okay, I'll eat it, you know. And their conscience is offended because they think they're doing something wrong. That's a weird scenario, isn't it? 
But food does not condemn us to God. For neither if we eat, we are the better, nor if we do not eat, are we the worse. But beware, lest someone, this liberty of yours, becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge, eating at an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest it make my brother stumble. Paul says, listen, if there's something that I'm doing that's offending somebody else's conscience and emboldening them to go do something that is against their conscience, then I need to cut it out. Well, what do you mean? If there's something that I do that stumbles somebody else, I need to cut it out. Because do I love them or do I love my liberty? What ends up happening is we get selfish and say, I could do anything. Listen, this meat's nothing. And it's cheaper than all the us. I can get a nice lean peat, a piece of meat for a buck a pound. I'm having a barbecue. I don't care what you think. See, there's no love in that. You're not thinking about the soul of another person. You're just thinking about your own appetite. Amen. Don't put a stumbling block in front of your brother. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others as ourselves? That's what we need to do above insisting upon our own way. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Put that way, it just sounds silly. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. If you eat and you don't give a rip what somebody else says, or you drink and you don't care what anybody else thinks, you're not of the right mind. So let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth, but what is good and necess for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So when I speak and say something, it's because it's meaningful to you, not because I got to say it. I got to say this. It's not about me. It's about being good for you and being nourishment or it's a reproof and you need to be corrected or it's a training or it's, a, it's something that's profitable for you, not because I got to say it. Philippians 2 verses 3 to 5 says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, living a sacrificed life and not being conformed to the world means we're not selfish. And it means that we don't do things to hurt other people, even if we feel like doing them. Verse 21, it is good neither to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. There are three categories. Stumbling, offended, made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. If there is something that you can't do in faith, in other words, I can't share this with Jesus. You know, and somebody have, you know, some people have convictions about coffee. Coffee's a drug. It has caffeine. It has een in it. It's a drug. It will alter your state. It changes your heart rate, your chemical makeup. The way you think, how fast you speak. Pastor Dave should have had a cup or two more. <laughs> Some people have convictions about alcohol. If, if, you can, if you can have a glass of beer and give one to Jesus who's right beside you at, because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit and you don't have a problem with that, good for you. 
What about smoking? Here, Jesus, let's share a cigarette. If, if you can have a cigarette, then certainly it means that Jesus is okay with that because he, he wouldn't have a problem. And now we have another problem, cannabis, which is now legal and you can get it from a dispensary. Isn't that wonderful? There are certain people that, yeah, it's, you know, it's cool. You know, it's all right. It's, it's you know, whatever. God made it and they don't make no junk, you know. I used to have a big problem with dealing drugs and smoking pot, so I will not be joining that train. But there's a way to act in love towards people where you're not going to stumble them. Don't smoke pot in front of me, by the way, because I will be offended, stumbled, and probably judgy. <laughs> I'm asking for your forgiveness already. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold at the meat market, asking no questions of conscience sake. In other words, don't ask questions. If you have to ask a question, you've got a problem. For the earth is the Lord's in all of its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. Like, hey, where'd you get this meat? Did you get it at the idol factory down the street? Really? <laughs> asking no questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, hey, this was offered to an idol. <laughs> Do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness, including people. Conscience, I say, not your own, but the one or the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? I'll tell you a quick story and we'll be done. As a young believer, I went to a wedding and I was very privileged to sit next to my pastor. And my pastor sat there, and at this wedding, everybody had a glass of champagne waiting for the toast. You, you've been there, right? And so I'm looking at the champagne, and I'm looking at my glass of water, and I'm sitting next to my pastor. And you know there's no way I'm drinking that champagne. Well, they get ready for the toast, and my pastor reaches out and grabs the champagne. And he stands up, and I'm like, And I said, you're not going to drink that, are you? <laughs> and he said, not now, I'm not. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 don't not drink it for me. You should, you should not drink it for the Lord. I mean, and like they're trying to give a toast and I'm having this deep <laughs> theological conversation with my pastor. He did exactly what the scripture said. Hey, man, this thing was offered to an idol. Really? Okay, I'm going to put it down. Not because I care, but because you do. Amen. And I didn't understand that. That's right. You guys understand this? Yes. It's about loving people more than your own liberty. Amen. Right. Oh, I do this every week. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Amen? Amen? Give no offense either to the Jews or the Greeks or the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. You see, do what you can to reach people for Jesus. And alter your behavior in such a way that you die to yourself and you're a living sacrifice to God and don't get conformed to the image of the world. Amen. It's serious stuff. Next week, we then who are strong ought to bear the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. 
we are to carry one another. That's what you do with somebody who's weak. You carry them. You don't deem them as wicked. And certainly you don't shoot them. So that's next week. Thank you guys for hanging in there.